In the last video, we set up our finite state machine, and we set up the logic that's going to help us transition between the various states. So within our finite state machine, we set up three states, we set up transitions, we set up conditions, and we set up parameters to drive those conditions. And then we wrote just enough code in our target player script to correctly move between the states based on where our turret is looking and where the player is. So the next step is that we need to start filling in the logic that's actually going to drive our turret AI. And we're going to do that in the targeting player state and the attacking player state with these behaviors that we've started to write. And where we left off last time, we had the target player script. And every frame, essentially, um, while the player is visible, we're going to be setting the angle that we would need to turn to face the player. So the next step is that we need to actually perform the turn. And we're going to perform the term over a number of frames. And um, we could do this with, say, a lerp. But um, if the player is going to be moving and we're going to be moving, um, that can get a little bit hairy. And if you just sort of lerp every frame based on your remaining distance, what's going to happen is that you're going to start moving very fast when your angle is large. And as you get closer and closer to looking at the player, your turning rate is going to slow down. And that's not what we want in this case. We want the turret to move at full speed until it's pointing directly at the player and then start firing. So what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to define a turn speed. And then I'm going to set that turn speed uh, up to some maximum speed that my turret can turn. So let me just go ahead and that, define that right now. And I'm going to make it a public variable so that we can set it in the inspector. So we're going to take our angle and we're going to somehow calculate a turn speed from that. And I'm going to just write the code and sort of explain what I'm doing while I'm doing it. So first we're going to have a left and a right turn speed based on whether our angle is greater than or less than zero. So if our angle is greater than zero, then our turn speed is going to be equal to, and we're going to take mathf.min of the angle and the maximum turn speed times time dot delta time. So sort of in plain English, what we're doing here is um, we're going to try and move our maximum turn speed, and we're going to move this essentially in units per second. So we're multiplying by time dot delta time to essentially get this in speed per second. And we're going to try and move that, but if the angle remaining to look at the player is smaller than that amount, then we're just going to move by that angle. And that's going to keep us from overshooting the player, essentially moving too far because we're moving too quickly. And so that's if we're in the positive direction. We can also do this for the negative direction. And it's going to be basically the same. We're just going to sort of flip the uh, oops, flip the magnitudes of things around. And of course, if we're neither greater than or less than zero, we're exactly at zero, and our turn speed is zero. So we've accounted for all our conditions here, and then we need to actually use this. So we have our turret. And our turret, since it's a transform, we can just use transform.rotate. And we're going to rotate uh, 0 in the x. We're going to rotate by turn speed in the y and 0 in the z. And that should be enough logic to get us started, to at least turn to face the player. So since we've written that chunk, let's go ahead and test it, see if it's working. So in my game, I'm going to start moving left. And when I become visible, sure enough, the target turret is going to move to start to try and face me. And if I select the turret gun, we'll see that it gets to within about 5 degrees, and that was our cutoff, and then it's going to start attacking the player. And if I move my player a little bit more, then eventually it's going to transition sort of uh, into these various states to where it's going to try and target the player again. Now one thing to note is that when we get in this attacking phase, we're not actually updating our rotation if the player gets more than five degrees away. What happens is if the player gets behind something, we go back to this waiting to player state, and then when we become visible, then our turret starts moving again. So our logic isn't quite correct. And what's actually happening is in this targeting player state, we're updating to face the player. In the attacking player state, we're no longer updating our rotation. We sort of get stuck in that state. So what we're going to need to do is in our attack player state, we're going to have to continue turning to face the player. So let's get started on our attack player state here. 
And again, we want this to be happening uh, every frame, so we're going to use this onStateUpdate method. And so I, before we get to moving while in the attack state, let's actually get the code that's going to attack. So our attack player code is going to fire bullets at the player. And first of all, we're going to be firing from the turret, so we need to get the turret transform. So transform turret is, and we use our singleton, and we just grab the transform attached to that script. So next up, um, we're going to need to fire a bullet. And what we're going to do is we're going to instantiate. So game object bullet is equal to instantiate. And we actually, within our uh, turret eyes, we have this public reference to our bullet prefab. So we're, again, just going to use our turret singleton. And this time, we're going to grab the bullet. The position is going to be the turret.position. And the rotation is going to be the turret.rotation. Uh, and we're actually going to use the local rotation, since our turret is a child of the, the turret base. And then we have to convert that to a game object. And once we've instantiated our bullet, we have to tell it to go. And I've added a rigid body to the bullet prefab, so we can grab that. And then we're going to set the velocity. Oops. And that's going to be equal to the bullet transform.forward. So our bullet's going to move forward at a speed of, and I guess we need to define a bullet speed. So we'll set public float uh, bullet speed. And to start, we'll set that to, I don't know, a value of 10. All right, and that should then start firing our bullet. So let's go back over to Unity. Let's give that a try. So my player is going to move over. And actually, our turret rotation is a little slow. So we're going to take a quick detour, pop back over to this targeting player. And note how in the target player script, we set this public float value. That'll show up right in our inspector when we click on that state. So I'm just going to change the turret speed to I don't know, four, five, something like that. Uh, just something to where we can get a, a good feel. Let's give that a try. That's a little bit better. I may actually want to have my turret move at a speed more like 10. So five times as fast as it was when we started. Let's give that a try. Yeah, so that looks much more like a turret. Now notice when our turret starts firing at our player, it's actually firing this constant stream of bullets. And if we go over and we look at this, we're going to see that it's essentially every frame going to be firing a bullet. So that is definitely not what we want. Um, so instead, we're going to have to go back to our script, and we are essentially going to have to define a fire rate for our bullets. And we can set up a public variable to adjust that fire rate. Um, so I'm going to create a public float and call this bullets per second. And we're going to just set this to two bullets per second to start. We can adjust this in the inspector later. Uh, and then we need to keep track of when we last fired a bullet, so that we know that we wait, in this case, half a second until we fire our next one. So I'm going to have a private float last fired bullet. This is going to store the time that we last fired a bullet. And then we're just going to do a check. If the current time minus the time we last fired a bullet is greater than, and since this is bullets per second, we actually have to invert this because we want seconds per bullet. So one over bullets per second. So if more time has elapsed than the time between firing bullets, then go ahead and fire a bullet and save the last time that we fired a bullet. And save that as the current time. All right, so let's pop back over to Unity. Let's give this a try see how this works. So as we move our player over, we're going to start targeting at the player, and oh, that looks much better. Now, notice again how our attack state essentially gets stuck, that once we get into our attack state, we're no longer updating our rotation to turn and face the player. So I think that should probably be our next step. And what we're going to need to do, if we go back over to this target player script, is we're going to need this stuff. This is the code that actually turns our um, gun to follow the player. So I'm just going to copy that, since we want basically exactly that. Paste it over here. Um, 
Looks like we're also going to need to calculate an angle, and for that we're going to need the player position relative to the turret. So I'll just go ahead and grab this code too. And something you may notice is that we've just duplicated a lot of code. Um, oh, and we need to duplicate even more. We need this maximum turn speed as well. We'll add that here. And generally, this is something we don't want to do when we're architecting our games. So this is not ideal, but for now, it'll work well enough. And sort of what we're doing here is we're saying that our attacking player is sort of a, a superset of the targeting player state. That the targeting player rotates the turret, and the attacking player rotates the turret and fires at the player. So we should now have everything. We grabbed all of our movement. We have our fire logic. So if we hit play, and start moving the player over, then sure enough we're going to turn, and our turret is going to keep turning to chase the player when we're in that fire state. Now it's turning a little bit slow when we're in that attacking state, and that's because in our targeting player we set the maximum turn speed to 10, so we'd want to set that to 10 here as well. And you know, while we're here, maybe we'll make the bullets a little faster. It's all kind of artistic. So let's try that again. Let's see how our turret behaves. Yeah. Now that looks much more like a proper intelligent turret that's going to be trying to find and kill our player as they move around. And with that, we could call it a day. We have created a, uh, an artificially intelligent turret that has be behavior that the user recognizes as intelligent. And our turret looks for the player, fires at the player, uh, it behaves in a way that makes good sense. But we actually could do this a little bit better, um, and what we have to realize in this case is that we actually sort of have two separate things going on. Um, we can think of uh, our turret here, we, we have a, a motor that's going to be turning our turret, and then we have a mechanism that when it sees the player straight ahead, it fires at the player. So what we have here may actually be better represented as two separate finite state machines. One of them is going to turn the turret, and the other one is going to fire at the player. And each one is going to have sort of an on and off state, whether we're waiting for the player or turning, whether we're waiting for the player or attacking. So I'm going to turn off this attacking player, and for now I'm just going to mute these transitions here. And then I'm going to add a new layer. So we can have two finite state machines uh, within one animator controller. And we're going to call this uh, the attacking layer. And in the attacking layer, we're going to need two states. We're going to need the waiting state, and we're going to need the attacking state. And we're going to need transitions between them, so basically we're going to go through the same steps that we went through um, with the uh, other animator controller. And this time, I'm sorry, with the other state machine, and this time the states that we're going to pull are essentially between when we're not attacking the player and when we're attacking the player. So they're basically going to be these two states. So we're going to start attacking when our angle is between 5 and negative 5. We'll just go ahead and add those, get rid of the exit time. Oops. And then we're going to stop attacking when the opposite is true. So we're going to stop attacking when the angle is either, and we actually never quite finished this logic, um, we're going to stop, stop attacking when the angle is greater than 5 or less than negative 5. Now if we add another state here, this actually does an AND between the two of those. Whoops. So that's not what we want. What we actually want is a separate transition. So now we have two transitions here, and um, we're going to change when our angle is greater than 5, and we're also going to change when our angle is less than negative 5. Make sure that this has exit time, and we're going to go ahead and mute this. I wanted to show you as an example, but we're actually going to be recreating this in our attacking layer. So I'm going to make another transition so that we have multiples. And then, uh, let's see, we're not going to have exit time in either of them. And I'll just go ahead and turn that off. Oh, it's already turned off. Awesome. And when our angle is greater than 5, or when our angle is 
less than negative five, then we're gonna uh, essentially transition back to our waiting state. And then here's where we're gonna add our attacking script. And we have that in our list. I'm gonna go to our base layer, uh, and I'm just gonna look at the values that I set here. So 15, two, and 10. Go ahead and set those. Uh, we're actually going to turn some of these off though, because by doing this we have simplified our script. So our attack player script now, since it's on its own layer, it no longer has to keep track of rotating, uh, it no longer has to keep track of the angle, it has no longer has to keep track of the player. All it's going to care about is should I fire or not. And then we can get rid of this maximum turn speed as well. So now we're going to have two layers going at once, and the bottom layer is going to drive the rotation, and it's going to just constantly seek the player whenever the player is visible, and the attacking layer is going to wait until we're looking at the player, and then it's going to start firing. Looks like our logic is not quite correct here. Let's take a quick look. Ah, of course, uh, our parameters. When we start out, our angle is zero, and our base layer, when we're waiting for the player, we're not updating the angle. In fact, we're not doing anything. So we're just going to say that when we start, our angle is something large, something that's not going to cause our transition. So we're just going to set that to 100 until we get to this targeting player and we start updating that value. OK. So now let's take a look. So the turret turns, starts firing, and behaves pretty much like you would expect an AI turret to behave. So what we've done by adding that second layer is we've essentially gotten the, the same type of behavior as before, only we've done it with a lot less code and we've done it with less duplication. So sometimes it actually does make sense to use two state machines versus one, or to set up your state machines a little bit differently to get the behavior that you want. A lot of setting up state machines is just thinking about the different states, the transition between them, and how can you organize a complex behavior into a finite number of states. And just as a, a sort of parting warning, not every behavior is well described by finite state machines. There are other ways to do AI, uh, other methods of keeping track of things. But in our particular case, the finite state machine that we set up, the couple of layers that we have, the base and the attacking layer, um, our various states, and the very simple control scripts that we were able to build did a really nice job of setting up this turret and allowing us to have sort of semi-intelligent or at least intelligent seeming behavior for an enemy in our game. Uh, it took about, oh, 25, 30 minutes uh, here in the video. So this is something that you can really start to set up very quickly in your games.